This program is made possible by grants from the Maryland Humanities Council and the National Endowment for the Arts. And Dar talks with Roland Flint. Welcome to The Writing Life. We have the pleasure today to talk for a while with the distinguished poet Anne Dar. This is the week of the 50th anniversary of victory in Europe, and coincidentally, or not coincidentally, it's the 50th anniversary of a little-known Army unit, Air Force unit, called the Women's Army Service Pilot Organization, and in which Anne Dar was a pilot during World War II. And in connection with that, she has a new book called Flying the Zuni Mountains, and we're going to talk with her a little bit about it today and uh, hear some poems from it. But first of all, Anne, welcome. Thank you. It's nice good to, to see, see you, too. Anne yes. and I are old friends, so it's a, an added pleasure. And uh, I thought we would begin by your telling us something about this collection of poems. Well, flight has been my metaphor from the beginning. F flight, escaping, um, the power dream of flight, um, up from the ashes, and actually flying in the Air Force. And this book is about, as a collection of, out of my other seven books, they, I have taken the flying poems and put them into this book so that I would have it ready for, uh, actually, last fall, when the WASPs met in Washington for the first time. The WASPs being the Women's Air, Air Force, Force Service Pilots. Pilots not white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, yes, yes. which I also might be called, but I don't like that. So it was available in uh, last fall in 94, but it is your most recent book, isn't it? It is, yes. Uh -huh. And you say flight is your metaphor from the beginning. That is, even before you uh, were in this service organization? Oh, well. You know the story of my mother's death when I was three in an automobile accident, and they told me I could fly to heaven and see her. And I, I kept the childhood myth of flight when I got to the University of Iowa and found that there were civilian pilot training courses. They would take 10 people, nine men and one woman, to each course, and I was lucky enough to get one of those spots, and I learned to fly there. Um, I did know that story, but I wanted to hear you tell it again. <laughs> Anne uh, teaches uh, as an adjunct professor at American University in Washington, D.C., where uh, just a few years ago she was named the best teacher. She has, as she just pointed out, published eight books of poems and won numerous uh, prizes and awards, among them uh, the Bunting Prize in Poetry, an NEA grant in Poetry, and others as well. And uh, we're going to ask her to read something now from this new book. All right, I'd like that. This is a poem called Gather My Wings. There is a part of me that looks forever where a level land, where rows of grain run straightway to the wind. Once you have trained these senses, they stay trained. And though I have no need for landing, forced or free, this noticing is part of me. Makes me check imprecisions of an eye correct for choppy heartbeats, hear a whipping tongue as dangerous. I must go out and gather in my wings. Once prepared for landing forced, one lives too much alerted. One listens for a twitch of snake, the thud of a seedy apple. That's a great poem to begin with after what you said about flight as, a, as your metaphor. Here it seems to be about emotional flight and uh, at the other end of it, uh, emotional grounding and landing? Well, I call this my Garden of Eden poem. It's a well, wonderful. How about, how about some more? All right. Let me read you the spelling lesson. Good. One of my favorites. You well, know, first of all, what, yes. uh, your, uh, your first name is, is not Anne, but what? <laughs> I won't reveal that. Oh, but, but, but your first name actually has the initial L. Yes. Is that right? Okay. Yes. And then Anne and Russell, huh? That's right. Okay. That's right. The spelling lesson. You know, I really believed that stuff, that if your initials spelled something, you'd be rich. 
So starting out with an L and an A and an R, I threw all those sheep's eyes, that's what we called the hungry look, at that young clinger boy. I don't know how he knew all he knew. Surely his older brothers couldn't have taught him all. But I am glad he was part of my growing up. For I truly loved him and he me there for several days that spring and summer. And we were warm and tender and trembled when we saw each other coming and would walk hand in hand around the little dark town and anticipate. As for simple love, there is none better. Years later, in a mess hall in Las Vegas, catching a bite before our towing target run, I said to my co-pilot, there's the back of a neck I recognize. She called me crazy, said she didn't care to fly with me again. We made a bet, and when he walked out of that mess hall, he was my young man beginning with Kay, who would have made me a lark to fit my flight pattern. But he was already married to a girl named Louise or Lucy or Anne with an E, and I had made a word of my initials, and they all spelled lard. The point back then was to become rich, and that is what we were, of course. In the middle of the Great Depression, between those two world wars, corn at two cents a bushel, clean and shelled. <laughs> Uh, and that small town right. in which you met that boy and knew that boy was Bagley, Iowa, isn't that so? That's, that's right. Ann and I also have in common uh, being from very small towns in, in uh, Iowa and North Dakota, respectively. Um, there were 25,000 applicants to the Women's Air Force Service pilots and and about 1,500 were accepted as applicants, but only 1,000 1, uh, made, made it through the rigorous training program. Anne already had a private flying license from her courses at the University of Iowa. Isn't that so? Yes. All of the women had to have hours before we were taken into uh, even uh, to do the, uh, um, the original testing. We had to have, at first it was 500 hours uh -huh. in high horsepower planes, and then they dropped that down and gradually, finally I had enough hours at 48 that I could uh, apply. Well, why don't you tell just a little about the kind of uh, missions that uh, your organization flew. I know you were uh, domestic. That's right. We only flew in this country, but there was much ferrying going on. Uh, by wasps from one end of the country to the other. Of troops, of parts? Or? Airplanes from factories. Oh, I see. To uh, bases where the, the cadets were training. Now, I was stationed first at a, a base in Stockton, California, where I, they called us engineering test pilots. I tested planes after they had been uh, through their 20-hour regular checks or after they had been crashed and uh, needed, they were repaired, and somebody had to fly them and find out if they were all safe for the men to fly again. Ah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like and hazardous duty, and you also towed but target... I, that's uh, the main thing I did, was towing targets in a gunnery school in Las Vegas. Meaning that uh, gunners on the ground and in the air would shoot at them while you towed them? Uh, in Las Vegas, it was air to air. Uh, we flew TB-26s trainer bomber 26s that had an extra foot on the end of each wing and uh, towed a target behind us that the B-17 pi uh, cadets, uh, the gunners, uh, fore and aft on each, on each side, red, blue, yellow, green, uh, the bullets were dipped in colored wax so they could tell whose bullet had shot, had hit the uh -huh. target when we released it. Um, but I hope the tow line was long, huh? Uh Well, um, I don't I was never shot down, but unfortunately, there, that wasn't the case in um, some of the other places where it was ground to air, and uh, that wasn't a problem of shooting down, but uh, sabotage was uh, sugar in the gas tank, um, put several uh, planes out of commission. Didn't I read that some almost 40 women did die in the service? 38, 38. wasps died in the service of their country. Really fascinating, but let's get back to 
some more of the poems. Um, Shall I read Hangar 9 for I think, you? I think that would be a good thing to read now. Yes. All right. Um, Upon receiving an invitation to place my name in a time capsule at the dedication of Hangar 9 as an aerospace museum because I flew with the Women's Air Force Service pilots known as the WASP. Place your name in a time capsule, aerospace shrine, dedication of Hangar 9. The morning mail condenses me in part of the blue I want to become. I dive to the bottom of my old trunk to retrieve my silver wings. I come up goggle-eyed. I put on another hat, black cherries with a veil, and Winston Churchill is dead in the great cathedral. They buried the trees when your flyers came over. Let us eat our fill of strawberries before they plowed the berries under, and to make the runways, they cut and buried the trees. The cherry tree leaves are cherry red, and I am wearing black cherries for the dead. No, I am bareheaded, and Wiley Post has crashed in our front hall, black patch and all. I learn he traded his eye for his plane. All right, use the insurance money. The headlines are squirming in the sun. It is the Ides of August, and Alaska has brought him down. Not alone, Will Rogers went down with him, who never met a man he didn't like. Wiley Post, born on a bloody date, a November 22nd, when a crashed career drained the rest of us of dreams we'd been afraid to dream since childhood, that God was with us after all, that faith and courage weren't misspelled words in a computer, and suddenly joy was splitting apart like old chi chicken entrails, where my grandmother ground off the chicken head with her heel and threw the spastic body in the dust that August afternoon where I crouched in the grapevines, stiffened like death when the headless body went by. It was Wiley Post, and I knew I was going to fly. Place your name in a time capsule, what I've been trying to do. Mine was to be a poem to wrench your lungs, now here it is all so simply. Because one January, deep in snow, an Alaskan day in Manhattan, I thought I learned the reason I learned to fly. I made my gesture to save Paris. I thought that Paris was where I was trying to go. The Germans hold the city of light, and copying the English girls who pulled on helmets, parachutes, and boots, and took to air, I threw my lot in with the flyers. War is now a dirty word, and I am marching, marching. When did WASP turn into an obscenity? We flew with honor for a cause. People were being burned in furnaces. Human skin made lampshades exquisitely thin. We cannot sit by, place your name in a time capsule. Would Will Rogers have liked Hitler? Lucky Lindy flew all alone in a little plane all his own. And I am pumping the player piano in my grandma's cold parlor and playing a saxophone, discarded by my brother who paid for it with nickels and found he wasn't musical. And I am standing leaden, astonished, in the great Smithsonian Hall, learning for the first time that Lindbergh, flying the Atlantic, could not see out. There was no windshield, no windshield at all. I wanted to run tell somebody, my God, what this man has done. He flew into the unknown, blind as Wiley Post's eye, blind as a headless chicken. But that was long ago, and great drafted birds are flying over I hear their drone, and what one man has done makes no matter. We are all flying blind. Place your name. Amelia Earhart with a tousled head was more than a set of rawhide suitcases. I had a haircut like that when Grandma cut it under a bowl, and all those fat curls lay on the floor as if they had been killed. Did she die alone? Everyone dies alone. Amelia Earhart, lost at sea, lost at sky, coming on with a meaning she never intended. Luggage, luggage. I wish that I could recreate her skin, bid her walk into a room again. What a dream she must have had. Papa's hand was big and warm to hold mine when we watched the eyes of heaven, eyes of mother and God and maybe Abraham Lincoln. I once knew a German boy who said he had drunk from the Big Dipper. 
And Michael Carmichael in her cocked hat flew all the way to hell and back while cancer ate her heart. Impossible. The impossible happens all the time. Walk on water, walk on the moon, kitty hawk, kitty dove, kitty hawk, go fly a kite. And those bicycle brothers did. They made their own music. You can still hear it if your ear is cocked right in the cockpit. Place your name, Edward White, Gus Grissom, Neil Armstrong, Amelia Earhart, Wiley Post, Lindbergh, Orville, Churchill, Lincoln, Socrates, Icarus, God, Beelzebub, Papa. Place your name. Freud might have said that mine was a death wish to join the conglomerate blue, that it was heaven I meant to reach, not Paris, that wanting to place my name is grandiose. I place his name, Freud. We walk in space every day of our lives, and our name is on that piece of space where we bolster the air and live it however we dare and dream of flying. Wonderful, thank you. It does um, place your name, doesn't it? The poem places your name and places the service of these extraordinary pioneer women among a great tradition of dreamers and uh, dreamers of flight and the transcendent. Don't you think that's part of it? I don't yes. want you to analyze your own poem, but that's what I hear going on in it. I hear more and more every time I read it. <laughs> that must be nice. <laughs> the first few times I, after it was written that I, I read it, I would burst out uh, in tears at a different place each time, and I had to go back and read it enough times that uh, I would know where to watch what was happening emotionally. I think it was Swift uh, talking years after he'd written Tale of a Tub saying, with wonder, what a genius I was then. <laughs> you, saw, you remind me a little of that. Now, that's a nice sensation to have afterward. Well, how about a very different kind of poem so that uh, people unlike me who have the pleasure of reading your poems for years can hear the, uh, the, some other kinds of things you do. How about that little rhyme poem called Transformed? All right, here it is. Transformed. Twice on the reasonable side of dead, I tried to recoup what the wise men said, tried to recover the reason why we're set on the earth to live and die. Twice on the reasoning side of gone, I tried to recall what was going on when spinning began in this holy place, how we came to be anchored in this Lent space. Twice in moments en route to dying, I've been too close, alone and flying. I expected bells. It was banshees crying. But twice in moments of dreadful peace, I knew the power of sheer release. The answer was there within my eye. I forgot it all when I didn't die. Very cunning little poem, I think. Very nice. Uh, I noticed, though, that even in Hangar 9, there are some, there occasionally rhyme works its way in. Oh, yes. And uh, uh, I left that in on purpose because I liked it. There I is, do too. There is a rhythm about flying that needed to be included in that uh -huh. poem. Well, thank you for that. How about, uh, how about another one? Well, um, how about instructions for survival? Good. It's one I was hoping to right? do. This is, um, this is a found poem. This is straight out of our... <laughs> By a found poem, you mean you found most of it printed in some other, for some other purpose, is that uh, so? This, these were our instructions. Aha, uh -huh, good. In our instruction manual, if you will. You, pol you women pilots are on your way to becoming precision flyers. It's your responsibility to remain alive. So it's entirely up to you. The decision that bailing out is necessary, the act of leaving your plane, the procedure during descent, the landing. It's never too late to jump. Is that what you think? If it is, you can get it right out of your helmet. The lowest altitude from which it is safe to jump from a plane is the lowest altitude at which your chute will open early enough to permit a safe landing. You must be free and clear of the plane when your chute opens. And the headlong dive is the best method of ensuring that. Your headphones should be disconnected and your oxygen tube should be detached. Invert the plane and dive out. Whatever you do, do it fast, but do it calmly. Use your head, 
Obey a few simple rules and you'll have no trouble. <laughs> Easy for them to say, right? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> these are all poems from Anne Dar's most recent book, Flying the Zuni Mountains. Uh, and it is published by Forest Woods Media Productions or the Bunny and the Crocodile Press. And uh, I encourage you to get hold of it. It's a fine collection that takes poems from uh, everywhere in Andar's uh, career as a poet. And speaking of that, how about a poem from an earlier book, Anne? Oh, all right. Why don't I read from uh, Cleared for Landing? Wonderful <laughs> titles, Anne, has. Uh, uh, is it the 12-pound cigarette or the 10-pound cigarette? The 12-pound 12 12 cigarette. 12-pound cigarette. <laughs> the last and, one uh, I ever smoked. <laughs> Riding with the Fireworks, The Myth of a Woman's Fist, St. Anne's Gut, wonderful titles. And here, this one is Cleared for Landing, another, uh, another flying book. Huh? Yes, there's a long flying poem in here, but let me read you this one. It's called The Reply, and it's for Roland Flint. Really? Yes. As if I didn't know, huh? <laughs> <laughs> what shall we say to our sister? Say that we have found a way to ground the sun say that we will come back over the rim of the world and load her on our sled and travel together forever after and she will never be lonely again say that and she will say she has broken open the egg of the world and found it empty and she has climbed into the boat of the oceans and the sails were missing and she has listened to the cottonwood leaves rattle their death rattle through every season of the year and has risen in the middle of the night to mount the sled and the snow glistens under the moon, the laughter freezes. Say to our sister that she need cry no more. We will bring buckets for tears to empty them in the oceans, so they will do no more harm in the garden, so the salt will buoy up our bodies instead of killing the plants. Say that we have found the secret of light in Greece. Say she will never need to live without lovers. Say she will grow new bone marrow to replace the old. Say you are sorry it comes too late to do her any good. Say that. And she will say hocus pocus, and she will say Santa Domingo Alamanocus, and she will say open sesame seed and don't ever darken my door again. And she will say hickory dickory dock, my death will stop the clock. And she will say thank you and farewell. The jig is up. And say to our sister how her bone marrow has blighted the garden and hell is in her head. How the earth is a great cereal box with a prize inside, the Garden of Eden. And she will say she has walked the railroad ties searching for copperheads. She has grabbed the axe that struck the rattles from the rattler's tail. And she has become sister to the snake by watching him hold his head alert in the grass to observe the light. Wonderful image of the snake, you know. It reminds me of that William Carlos Williams poem. Uh, a sort of song in which he says that's, that's what the writing is like, like a, a snake patient to wait under its rock and uh, knows when to strike. It's a wonderful image. I should say, just by a little explanation, that I had written a poem to Anne about what I thought were some angry poems of hers, and I don't remember much about it now. Her reply was so much better, I put mine away forever. That wasn't fair. You were supposed to publish yours, well, too, and you didn't. Yours overshadowed it so much I didn't have the nerve. Uh, at any rate, um, we have a, a little time left. Uh, how about um, back to uh, Flying the Zuni Mountains? How about th that little poem, Are We Alone? All right, let's see. Um. Again, a free verse poem, but with some suggestion of rhyme and a very cunning little poem, I think. Are we alone? Are we alone who scan the sky for rain, a fat and falstaff cloud, and a damned star, a ready wind wrapping the desert, and the sand still, never counting on one hand, never counting at all? Wonderful. I think we have enough time for me to hear another of my favorites, if you're, if you're agreeable. Everything I Ever Flew is Obsolete, and then maybe you could end with the title poem for the book. Oh. Everything oh. I Ever Flew is Obsolete is on page 105. Thank you. It's, uh, the book is still new enough that I can't always open it at the right place. Everything I Ever Flew is Obsolete. All I Ever Flew is what brought me here. 
Pavarotti did the film, and we picnicked on the Boston Pops Green, warned not to look up at the helicopter shooting film, like the drama of watching Father Rosalie fall in love with Catherine Ann Porter and her pet Emerald. I fell in love with every Clark Gable who came along, unless I was already in love with the <laughs> Leslie Howard. We didn't mean to bring the movie down. We loved it anyway. One woman's success is another female's future failure. The propeller in the living room is no more improper than the coffin next to the fire. Wonderful, wonderful juxtaposition of images there. Well, what about the title poem of this remarkable book, Flying the Zuni mm -hmm. Mountains? Seems to me a good one to close our little time All right. with. And thank you, by the way, for well, thank you for this having time. me. I've enjoyed it. Flying the Zuni Mountains. Hold death by the heels and tickle his nose with a feather. For the wind is our blood, it will blow itself away. Never a dark red rivulet trickling through the grass beside the bolts and the pressed wood props made in Camden, New Jersey. Let the engine drone a funeral dirge, the sharp staccato when one cylinder plays alone. The quiet, just the wind, no sound when the ribs crumple, like the old tree falling in the forest with no one to hear. For we are not there. We stand and lean on a cloud and call for another beer. <laughs> this we know. We are the wind. We will come back gently over the lake. And we will lash the waves and bend the trees. We will lie side by side on the high mountains, drinking martinis and telling the old jokes over. Never our wings will melt or crumple with heat or hardness. This we know. For the man who draws the blueprints shapes the wings, threads the bolts, pulls the props, is not our faith. Ours is the wind, and the wind is us, and no one shall bury us ever. We have known space not surrounded by closets and cabbages cooking. We have whirled rainbows over our heads. We have owned the earth by rising from it. Never again shall we walk with ordinary feet. The wings were shaped from a woman's weeping. No other tears shall fall. Thank you, Anne. Thank Good you, ending Roland. to our to our meeting. My pleasure. And thanks for watching. I'm Roland Flint for the Writing Life. <laughs>